All right. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Kolsky. I am the director of the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest at Villanova University, where I am also a faculty member in history. Um, I'd love to welcome back those of you who have been with us for months now as, we've, as, we, as, we, as we have been investigating this theme of decolonizing history. Um, and also to those of you who are just joining us, we're also very happy to, to have you. Um, decolonizing, this just a moment on the, the format here. This is going to be about a 30 to 40 minute conversation with our guests followed by questions and answers. Um, this is the third and final event in this month long series of a sub theme on decolonizing empire and decolonization. And we hope that all of you will join us next month as we continue our investigation of decolonizing history, featuring speakers who will be looking at the issue of decolonizing art. And I see my colleague, Tim McCall here, um, who, will be, who will be helping um, host those events. Um, as many of you know, you know, decolonizing history is, it's a method. Um, it's an important kind of issue of our times. It's a, it's a way of questioning which people and places are at the center of the study of the past and why. Um, it offers a critical lens through which we can look at history and what we know about the past. And in some ways, it's about challenging Eurocentrism. But that's not only what it's about. And what we've been trying to do in this month's event is kind of complicate what we mean by decolonizing history. It's not simply about kind of um, decentering Europe. And in fact, when we maintain this connection or attachment to the idea that there's a dominant West and, is, and it's a, and a, um, an oppressed non-West, it leads to kind of post-colonial predicaments that our, that our speaker for today um, has recently written about. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is introduce our speaker, um, introduced uh, Andy Liu, who's gonna be kind of moderating the discussion today. And then we'll have, as I said, about 30 minutes of, of time where we're kind of in conversation and we'll leave at least 20 minutes or so for all of you to um, ask questions. If you are inspired or have questions as we're talking, post your questions in the chat. Um, but if you don't mind putting your microphone on mute until around until we kind of unmute all of you as it were, that would be much appreciated. Um, so our speaker for today um, is Dr. Natasha Call, who we are absolutely delighted to, to have. Uh, Dr. Call is a multidisciplinary academic, novelist, poet, economist. Um, she has been working over the past two decades, researching and publishing extensively on themes relating to democracy, political economy, identity, the rise, the rise of right-wing nationalism, and feminist and post-colonial critiques of same. Um, her books include Imagining Economics, Otherwise, published by Routledge in 2007, Future Tense, published by HarperCollins in 2020. Um, she was uh, shortlisted for the Man Asian Literary Prize for her book uh, Residue, published in 2014. Um, in 2020, she published a book called Can You Hear Kashmiri Women Speak with Kali for Women, the important feminist uh, Indian Feminist Press, and currently she is an Associate Professor in Politics and International Relations at the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster in London, having previously served as Associate Professor in Creative Writing in Bhutan and a tenured Assistant Professor in Economics at the Bristol Business School. She holds a joint doctorate in Economics and Philosophy and a Master's in Economics with a specialization in Public po Policy from the University of Hull. She writes and speaks within and without academia. And for that reason, we thought she was the perfect person um, to bring into conversation today with my colleague, Andy Liu, um, who has co-organized all of the events for this month and who is an assistant professor of history at Villanova and recent author of the book, T-War. So I'm gonna let Andy kind of frame a little bit of the discussion today before we pass the proverbial, the proverbial mic to Natasha. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so I thought I would just kind of do some of the basic uh, foundation just to kind of give everyone a sense of, uh, you know, I know not everyone is familiar that familiar with this history in this part of the world. So to help Natasha just kind of give some dates and facts. 
Um, and to also uh, say at the beginning, you know, a lot of this what we'll be discussing is based on an article, a really long and interesting article that she wrote for Made in China Journal. So if you want to look that up, Made in China, Natasha College should like, you know, be the first Google result, right? Um, and so the basic premise is a comparison between what is happening in this territory called of Western China called Xinjiang and in, uh, I guess, Northern India or the borderlands of Northern India, Central Asia called uh, you know, Jammu and Kashmir. The basic history lesson would be something like, you know, both Jammu and Kashmir and Xinjiang were not, were only really connected with quote unquote, you know, China proper and India proper by way of these 18th to 20th century empires, right? And then in the 20th century, you know, we have the Mughals, the British and the Qing. And in the 20th century, you have these new nations, independent China, independent India, that are claiming self-determination and sovereignty. But the irony of course, is that they kind of basically inherit the imperial borders of what came before them, the very empires that they were struggling against, right? So there's a sort of irony at the very beginning of the inception of the relationship between these territories and um, you know, modern China, modern India. And this is 1940s, 1950s. Um, the question of religious identity comes up when these regions are discussed. So to give some basic facts and figures, Jammu and Kashmir have approximately 7 million people and roughly 70 to 80% identify as Muslim. Um, and a lot, most of that is in the Kashmir Valley. Xinjiang, uh, which is kind of, you know, th these are regions that border each other, right? In sort of the Central Asia, Central Eurasia region. Xinjiang, which is sort of like the Western, Northwestern frontier of China today, was almost entirely um, non-Chinese 50 years ago. And today, because of you know, internal colonization policies, it's about, we have about 12 million Uyghur people who are identified as Muslim and 10 million Han Chinese people, right? So the, the gap is narrowing, but it was historically majority Muslim. In both cases, we have the Hindu, a Hindu and a Han Chinese majority government kind of labeling dissent in these territories as separatists and terrorists. And in recent history, uh, these, uh, the, the sort of tension between these regions have accelerated. In, in China, starting in 2009, just the most recent events, we have these violent protests in the city of Urumqi, the capital of Xinjiang. In 2014, a declaration of the people's war on terror by the government against so-called Muslim uh, separatists. And uh, in recent years, depending, you know, there's a lot of um, debate about this in the news, but even the PRC would admit there are these camps with over a million Uyghur people detained in these camps in Xinjiang. In South Asia in August 2019, the government of India revoked Article 370 of the Constitution, which had granted Jabu and Kashmir a level of relative political autonomy. Um, so by revoking that, they more or less, I guess, annexed or sort of aggressively tried to move into that territory. And since then, the people of that region have faced censorship, surveillance, curfews, um, you know, telephone and internet access has been cut off or is very limited, and even talk of potentially opening de-radicalization camps, right? So all this is to say, you know, something is going on in these regions that you may have seen in the news. Um, and Natasha is, does the interesting uh, argument of kind of putting them together and trying to compare them instead of thinking about them separately. So I guess I want to ask Natasha to begin to sort of how, how would she kind of want us to understand and explain these events and uh, ultimately she, she proposes an argument in her article that says uh, what she calls the moral wound of colonialism, that this has something to do with the sort of long lasting legacy of post-colonialism and the, the sort of claim of injury by the West or injury by Western powers um, in this part of the world. So and Natasha, you know, please feel free to sort of um, enlighten us on your argument. Uh, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that introduction and Andy for setting um, the argument up. So um, I'm going to try my level best to go through some of these things in the short span of time, but hopefully then we'll have this discussion and you can ask, you know, all of you who are listening in can ask questions and, and that way I, we can kind of go into greater detail with some of these things. But at its broadest, uh, the idea here and what I wanted to do uh, with, with that article, and also it's, it's part of a long-term process of thinking, is in this case to look at the ways in which Kashmir and Xinjiang re region, Kashmir broadly referring to as a term that, that entire region, um, have, have witnessed the exercise of a particular form of political power 
exercised by India and China respectively and how that power is legitimized. And in that it's important just that apart from the coercive structures and the uh, you know, explicit militarization, my interest is also in looking at the ways in which st these structures of oppression are, um, are accompanied by the discourses of legitimization. So how is the consent created within those countries and amongst those populations with people who either are indifferent or um, you know, ignorant or outrightly support these projects. So, so how is that? How is that possible? So, so my interest broadly, therefore, uh, at, at its broadest, is looking at the ways in which there is an institutionalization and systematization of the the you know of the uh, structures of legitimization, the narratives of dispossession. How does all of that work, and what is the role of memory in that? So, how how is memory put to work in? Uh, you know, memory of, of a history, real and imagined histories and multiple histories, how does that play a role in, in uh, you know, in, in, in addition to the outright coercion? So, um, and I theorize that in terms of what I call the moral wound of colonialism, and I'll get to it. But before that, I just want to kind of set out a few other things, say a few other things about Kashmir and Xinjiang in that they share a border. They're both Muslim majority regions. They're, uh, you know, they're not, um, there is no overwhelmingly uh, overwhelming affinity that is felt, for instance, by Indian Muslims for Kashmiri Muslims, even though Kashmiri Muslims are seen primarily and predominantly as Muslims by by you know by the powers in India. So it's it's a it's a this is and this is one of the questions we'll discuss later is the ways in which uh, you know the the kind of broader rubric of Islamophobia how how does that help us make sense of what's going on. Um, so they are stigmatized as Muslims, they're framed as radical, they're subject to securitization regimes, rights are denied, and all of this is um, carried out in the name of development and progress, and in the Indian case, in the name of democracy and the world's largest democracy. It is worth bearing in mind that no contemporary colonial project dares to name itself as such. So uh, the very fact that these are these projects are termed as these, what you know, development, progress, modernization, etc., does not necessarily exculpate them from actually being something other than that. Uh, Kashmir has a has a complex history. Um, many of the things that we are that more people globally are able to see as happening there is not something that has happened only post 2019 but it's it's a longer history but it's much more explicit and kind of you know uh, out there now um so depending on where we start telling that history from you could go back from you know the revocation of autonomy and the loss of statehood in 2019 to uh to 2017 the use of human shield uh, which was praised as an innovation uh, and the person doing that, a Kashmiri civilian used as a human shield, which was praised as an innovation. And the person who had done that, the, the major, was rewarded for it. Uh, in 2016, the summer of pellet blindings, you go back to 2014, the floods, 2010, the, the you know, the uprising, 90s, enforced disappearances, uh, mass graves, use of sexual violence, 1980s, uh, you know, rigged elections between 50s and 80s, kind of center and periphery relationships that were, um, that I talk of in, in terms of a Mandarin Machiavelli interaction. Um, so there's, so there's, there's, and, and then of course we go back to 1947. On 14th and 15th August 1947, when India and Pakistan become newly sovereign, you know, post-colonial states, Kashmir is not, the future of Kashmir is not decided. The terms are actually set in a, you know, by a leaving colonial power, but have to be honored by these two newly sovereign post-colonial entities, uh, India and Pakistan post-colonial here. Uh, and they, um, you know, and 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 we have, and at that point, what happens is that this article. So there's a you know promise of a plebiscite and uh, instrument of accession that's signed, etc. So there's there's a longer history. Go back to 1846, which is when this territory was bought and sold. So that's that's how. So there is there is a, a you know so the, so the ways in which one can read this history is um is is complex, but also there is a parallel Indian anti-colonial national history of Indian anti-colonial nationalism. Now, the interesting thing is that um, at the point at which India becomes an independent country, there is uh, there are two competing nationalisms in India, two competing nationalisms. One is the secular Nehruvian sort of nationalism. Uh, there is, you know, there is debate about to ex the extent to which it is actually secular, but they, you know, it's seen as a secular developmental modernizing sort of nationalism, the Nehruvian nationalism. And there is an, an other nationalism, which is the nationalism espoused by the RSS. The RSS is a nationwide paramilitary founded in 1925, uh, banned at various times in the history of post-colonial India, but now very mainstream. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the all of the government 
the, the ruling party BJP, it's the ideological parent of that party. So, so now it's, it's very much kind of the center. But uh, the RSS version of nationalism, even way back in the 40s, always had an alternative idea of India as a Hindu nation, as opposed to a secular democratic country. And because of that, there, there was this, you know, Kashmir, they always saw Kash Muslim majority Kashmir as an unfinished project. So what happens in the post 2014 era is that that project gets taken up and, you know, and finally, when they revoke the Article 370, they're like, okay, now we're, we're, um, we've done this. So that's, that's sort of like the, the broader thing. The other couple of things I would want to point out is that after, so Kashmir is seen in this kind of, and again, this is where Kashmir and Xinjiang both have some sorts of parallels, is that these kinds of native others who are in need of education, modernization, liberation, uh, it, specifically their women need to be liberated from their men. So it's very much that kind of colonial orientalist rhetoric. Um, there is also, um, so from after uh, August 2019, uh, you know, some of the shocking ways in which this, uh, the revocation was seen, the Art Article 370 revocation was seen in the Indian um, uh, kind of popular sphere was to do with fair skinned Kashmiri women, Indian men being able to go and marry them, uh, being able to access Kashmir land in Kashmir, because according to that article, Indians could not buy land there. Uh, because it was a political dispute, the status of Kashmir was unsettled. Uh, it had its own autonomy in, in um, you know, apart from defense, telecommunications, and external relations. Uh, what happened fairly dramatically following on from that is that in 2020, uh, in spring 2020, the domicile law laws were changed uh, so that anyone who's, so within 15 days, actually, they made it mandatory so that within 15 days, anyone who's lived there for a certain amount of time, even if they are non-Kashmiri, can actually get the status of being a state subject. Uh, in, on 27th of October, and, and the, the date is significant here because that was the, the day in which the, uh, you know, that has to, that has to do with 1947. But on 27th of October, 2020, uh, new laws, the land laws were brought into effect so that anyone can now buy property there. Uh, so from the Kashmir point of view, the, the important change here is one that there is a demographic, um, there is a fear of demographic and settler colonial sort of um, change uh, being underway. And that people from, through these uh, domicile laws, through these uh, changed uh, laws, through the ability to designate any land as strategic, changing housing and urban infrastructure policy, through all of that, that there is, uh, that they would kind of change the, the structure, the, the kind of basics of that place. And, you know, one of the things that I feel is that it's really interesting is that in many ways, I think where China leads with Xinjiang, India may follow. And that's why I think that it's it's not there yet, but some of these things are are resonant. And the Indian Consul jour Journal in general in New York was actually filmed on on tape saying, "If Israel can do it, we can do it." It was you know super controversial uh, that that he'd actually explicitly said that we want to go and we want to take over the land. So uh, so from the Kashmiri point of view, this is a you know this is a project about land and resources, um, and 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 you know and and that's but it's it's carried out in the name of modernization, democracy, etc. Now the other thing is that um, the the let's let yeah I guess I have a lot to say on this but let me just get to the the point about the, the camp so that I can yeah so now let's let's get to the point about um, you know where I said that India is where where China leads India may follow so there's this kind of land and resource modernization project sort of commonality there's also the idea of surveillance and censorship which now has, has taken on a new turn. So in addition to the sorts of bans, you know, for instance, internet, longest ever internet shutdown was imposed in Kashmir. What they are now starting to do is to draft these kinds of volunteer, cyber volunteers. So any Indian can now sign up to be a cyber volunteer who takes it upon themselves to report social media content that, uh, you know, on Kashmir that is meant to radicalize people. So, so it's, it's in effect kind of setting up this online vigilante forces. And this is again, something that, you know, that is parallel there. There's also this idea of camps now under, uh, you know, under the, uh, this Modi government, which came to power in 2014 and was reelected in 2019, these, uh, these camps are presented as, you know, they were denied by the PM, but then accepted uh, in, in parliament by the lawmakers. These camps are presented as, you know, simply something to do with uh, keeping illegal immigrants apart. However, uh, there was also talk, there has also been talk uh, by you know by members of the armed forces about uh, de-radicalization camps for Kashmiri children. It was never clarified, but the idea was that the communication of Kashmiris amongst themselves radicalizes them. Um, now, why why is it possible to create consent in India for these sorts of things? 
well, partly it's media censorship and it's kind of the, the nation state centric framing in, in media coverage. And increasingly, this is something that has become with the farmers protests, with the anti, uh, the, there was this something called the National Register of Citizenship and the uh, CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act. Uh, which was a change that was brought in uh, and, and successfully brought in, which created a path into Indian citizenship for all other people, for, for, you know, in a specific way for people of other religions, but all except Muslims. So ex excluding Islam from, from those religions. Uh, so these, these changes within India and this kind of constitutional vandalization led to a lot of protests. And in the cases of these protests, the... Um, the, the media media and, and people are often, uh, you know, they're called seditious. Uh, numerous people are in, are in imprisoned, um, uh, activists, students, others, every other day we hear more of this. The world, the, there's also this, this thing to do with, you know, the, the Belt and Road Initiative in, on, in the Chinese context, in the Indian context, the access to the Indian market, the global commodity value chains. So all of that is there. Now, the additional thing that I, I want to kind of finish with and explain briefly is the role and status of the category West, which acts both as an attractor and as a repulsor in the kind of socioeconomic architecture uh, of, of global politics. By that, what I mean is that how we understand the term West is leads certain, makes certain kinds of things possible. Now, um, and, and in relation specifically to human rights. Now, if we think of why people don't talk, more people don't talk about Kashmir and Xinjiang together, you know, they, they don't, uh, that's because this idea of West is seen in such a way that colonial, colonial power is something that, you know, the West has the ability to exercise, the non-West doesn't. So, you know, the, the non-West cannot. Why? Because colonialism itself, so I'm going to go through like a series of um, you know, related kind of logical chain. So first that this, uh, the, the colonial power is seen as something that the West has and can exercise, the non-West cannot. Why? Because I argue that colonialism is understood as a moral wound of the colonized, formerly colonized, not of the colonizers. So it is seen as a, you know, as a shameful thing uh, in the national psyche, not to have been able to successfully resist colonization Whereas there is no equivalent narrative of shame for having colonized. Okay. Now, why is that significant? We know that is that that this is the case, and and that is empirically easy to to see. Now, why is that important? It's important because this allows a certain kind of messianic leadership in in you know in countries like India and China to to manipulate imaginaries of pride and futurity and promise a return to a pre-colonial, you know, a pre-colonial purity. Now, in that context, they see that, you know, that that the um, that the non-West cannot is effective at being non-Western and being formerly colonized or, you know, the subject to um, colonial sorts of forces, even if not explicitly colonized. That they are um, that they are immune to acting as colonizers themselves, but at the same time they are they are exercising power in the way in which the West historically did. So that this is how power is exercised in you know this is how you ex you know act in, in a, a powerful state acts in its at, at its peripheries, and this is what it's meant to for them to be rising. But also it is um, it is also that if critiques are raised of, you know, in, in relation to Kashmir or Xinjiang, then the idea is that one is being indophobic or sinophobic or regressive and even racist. Now, there is, of course, a certain spectrum of voices within certain parts of the world that is, that is racist and that is acting from that kind of right wing, uh, you know, space. However, when they say these voices are problematic and the reason they are critiquing us on Kashmir or on Xinjiang is because they want to stop us from, because we are non-Western, they want to stop us from rising. Well, then the question arises, how are they non-Western? So how is, how is India and China non-Western? Because they are not clearly not non-Western in the, uh, you know, in relation to consumerism or urbanization or, or allied infrastructures relating to that conspicuous consumption, etc. So it's not an economic kind of non-Western aspect here that is, uh, so the West is associated, therefore, what does it mean to be Western? It means to actually be concerned about human rights. Now, uh, rights, liberties, etc. 
Now that is further, the next step is that that is further problematic because the concern with uh, human rights by saying that that is an exclusive preserve of the West, firstly, it's, it flies completely in the face of the entire kind of Euro, you know, Euro American colonial history, um, you know, which, which uh, as, as decolonial scholars, people point out, well, actually there were all of, all of these massacres, et cetera, et cetera. So how can, how can the history of human rights be the unique preserve of one part of the world? And secondly, it gives away the entire kind of, you know, history of anti-colonial struggles for human rights in the non-West as being somehow irrelevant and invisible. And in addition, it also makes it impossible for us to see human rights abuses in the West, because surely the West is the place where human rights are from. So, so as a result, the overall effect of, you know, of um, this kind of overall polarizing effect, overall, um, not polarizing, magnetizing, field shaping effect of this term West in relation to human rights is, is deeply problematic. And, and this is, uh, you know, and, and it kind of, and this is why in, in places in, you know, in these places, people talk about indigenous versions of human rights, you know, the home minister in India, not so long ago said, we'll have our own Indian version of human rights. And there's also, of course, a, a longer history of that kind of argument. In addition, there is the economic aspect, which is where the role of the corporations come in that, you know, which, which could be based, which could be transnational, but of course, could also be based in, in, you know, inverted commas, Western countries. Uh, that actually benefit from these, um, you know, the surveillance and the repression mechanisms. So I think uh, maybe I should just stop there because um, I've obviously gone on for way longer than five, five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. But but maybe yeah. So now we can. Talk. Yeah, I mean, Elizabeth, uh, did you also uh, want to kind of maybe tee up the first question? Um, sure. I mean, I think you have presented such a rich, uh, like, um, framing of the problem as a historical problem. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm wondering, you know, when you talk about this whole idea of the moral wound of colonialism, right, the idea that colonialism is remembered as a wrong done to, done to us, right, and this leads to what you call the make India great again model, right, and how is the Modi regime going to make India great again, through claiming land, through doing all the same things that the colonet, that the so-called foreign Western colonizers did, um, and then also this role of history and remembering. And then I'm, 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 I know you're, 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 you're in England now, and of course in England right now, right? You're having all of these government efforts to silence academics who are trying to do the British down. So there's explicit efforts in Europe to remember colonialism, not as a wrong, as you're saying, but as something to be celebrated, as something to kind of take pride in. And this isn't only the case in India, of course, in the United States, we also had this 1776 Truth Commission and this speaking out against the 1619 project. So it just seems like around the world, kind of there are debates about history and memory and particularly debates about how colonialism is, is to be remembered. And I'm wondering if you kind of want to, you know, weigh in on that. Hmm. Yeah, so I just, um, you know, one of the things, so people in, in the Indian context say, um, you know, you're the average person who follows, uh, you know, the supporter of the RSS project and of the BJP and sees good in what's happening in Kashmir, um, does not only see the colonial, uh, the colonial history as a wrong done to them. Yes, that is part of that story. But it's also also at the same time a kind of spur and, and it's something worthy of emulation. So it's also that they were able to do this to us because we were not strong enough. And we, you know, and we once we are as strong as them, and if when we are like them, then we can we can also do what we like. And and that's kind of, you know, it comes out fairly explicitly in some cases, but it's um in with, with some of these leaders, like and their statements, but there's there's that. That, that curious way in which they understand this. In the UK context, yes, I mean, things like critical race theory, even, um, I mean, the, the, the current, uh, in, in a sense, you're, you're lucky in the US to have had some of these, all, albeit with all of these various you know, upheavals, but you, you've at least had a transition. <laughs> Whereas we here have a, a government that's, that's deeply problematic and has figures who, were, who have been known for their, um, you know, statements which are which have been misogynist or, or racist. So yes, remembering, you know, that the, there is a, 
a kind of effort to remember the empire as some kind of neutral globalizing thing that you know that's that's all it was it just brought progress and and what it what it where it where it failed that was just an anomaly that wasn't an integral part of the process through which dispossessions and erasures and all of that was created so so there is a yeah there's de there's definitely a um an, a need to address this idea of you know, of imperial nostalgia in the West and equally of this kind of uh, idea of, of a return to a putative post-colonial, pre-colonial purity in the non-West. That, you know, both of these are actually projects of the same kind, of the same kind. They, they want to go back to that kind of a past and, um, and, and, and are very successful actually. Um, large numbers of people in, in both, you know, actually do believe and the Brexit project did show us uh, arguably that, you know, imperial nostalgia works <laughs> and and likewise the in, in india the, the project of you know this kind of hindu nationalist project or or han chauvinist project these projects show that this idea of what a, a strong and powerful state is how do we recognize a state as being strong and powerful and as having arrived in effect the whole idea of power i mean if we we think about it in the, these um kind of conventional ir terms that it means the ability to be able to do these things and and therefore uh it's unsurprisingly they um they they have their their adherence and and people who think that this is exactly the right sort of thing to be happening um yeah and I mean, we can we can sort of just one little thing to add yeah. i think the the way to perforate these kinds of rhetoric is to draw attention to the problematic legacies of you know the complicated problematic histories of what imperialism actually did what colonialism actually did also to the fact that anti-colonial nationalisms are not something that, you know, decolonization is not something that kind of happened. Uh, and, and, and it's just like now it's over in by mid 20th century or whatever. It's not like the final decolonization of the world hasn't, hasn't already happened and now we have nothing to talk about. Uh, you know, so, so therefore there are, there are these other anti-colonial nationalisms in, you know, post hyphen colonial parts of the world that actually are, are uh, you know, are, are worthy of, of attention. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, let me, do you mind if I ask like one more question and then we should open up to the audience. If the audience has any questions, please feel free. We have a couple already coming in. Um, so just to really quickly perhaps summarize what I think I hear you saying is that um, a, a lot of times when we talk about anti-colonialism, we kind of unintentionally glorify colonialism, if that makes sense, right? We kind of unintentionally glorify the you know, the, the complaint isn't so much that one group has military and economic power over other groups. The complaint from the perspective of like a post-colonial people in China or India would be like, well, there were the Europeans who had all the power, but if we had all the power, then we would actually be kind of happy with that, right? And in a sense, you're saying that they kind of absorb the form of empire, the form of nationalism without questioning it. Um, and I think that's, that's a point well taken. And it's something obviously that comes up a lot uh, uh, when we talk, when we had um, speakers talking about other parts of the world. I, I wanna ask another question that I think um, is, is unrelated or not related. It's a separate question that I think you've brought up that I think is worth talking about, which is, you know, you brought up this fact that um, Indian Muslims and Kashmiri Muslims have no particular affinity for each other. In the article you talk about how, you know, in China, Hui Muslims and Xinjiang Muslims, there isn't necessarily, I think what you're trying to do is to say that there isn't some primal explanation, religious explanation, that anyone who identifies as Muslim is automatically, let's say, on the same side, or like they're talking to each other all the time, right? And uh, and so the question is like, how then do we think about this category of religion? You talk about how these conflicts have been communalized, which to me makes it sound as if you're saying there are, let's say, economic or political reasons for these conflicts, but then the media and even academics are guilty of using religion as a very sort of easy shorthand um, to talk about it. On the other hand, right, we are talking about an article which I think is very, has a very useful comparison. But this article kind of, I think comes from the, the, the basis of the article is that we have this persecuted religious, religious minority group being persecuted, right? Kind of next door to each other. And that what they do have in common is that, is that they are Muslim, right? right? Identify as Muslim. So I guess the, I mean, that's a diff I think there's a difficult question there in terms of how exactly do we negotiate that? We don't want to make religion, make it sound like this is a religious conflict, like this is a civilizational conflict, right? Um, I know um, uh, uh, one of our speakers last week, Jim Aliden, who I think might be in the audience, has kind of talked about the idea to, 
the the need to kind of problematize kind of using Samuel Huntington like ideas about Muslim civilization to challenge the West, right? But on the other hand, there's obviously some sort of usefulness um, in your article of foregrounding these commonalities and these comparisons. So I was just kind of wondering if you could speak to, did you, how did you wrestle with that in your own thinking about is, is, this, is religion a, a useful category or not? Right, so I'm really glad you asked me this question because uh, this is something that, that deserves a lot of attention. I think that you see the, 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 the role and place of religion in all of this is, is a very overdetermined one. So there's, there's lots of things that are happening. It, there's no kind of linear straightforward way of understanding what, is, what role religion is playing. Uh, so so let's, let me just, so there are a few things I want to say. Is, if we think of Kashmir and Xinjiang, is, is global Islamophobia a useful way to think about about that as a, as a kind of overarching uh, thing. Um, to an extent, the answer is somewhere between yes and no, because those people, when people are, and, and some of this actually references back to Arendt's point about you know, Jews being persecuted because they were Jews and not just abstract individuals during, uh, you know, the, the, in Nazi Germany. So there's this idea that, they, that when the state says that you can't act, you know, when the state on the day of Eid, uh, uh, an important uh, Islamic festival, um, imposes a curfew, forbids people from praying, or in, in the Chinese case says, you know, you can't have be be beards or, you know, or kind of deliberately enacts policies that, are, that go against people's religious identity, um, then yes, they are being persecuted as Muslims. Likewise, a dispute in a Muslim majority, a political dispute, a territorial dispute. I mean, a, a well-recognized dispute that, for instance, you know, the UN for the first, you know, early years of, of post-colonial um, South Asia in the 50s, 60s, it was the most important thing preoccupying the UN. Was, you know, one of the major important disputes it was involved in was, was the Kashmir dispute. So there was a political dispute. Now, if that dispute happens to be in a region which is Muslim majority, then it is simultaneously a political dispute, but also in a territory that is inhabited by people who have a certain religion. And some of that political expression, such as when you know, people chant certain kinds of slogans during funerals of, uh, you know, of people killed, those are, those are sometimes religious slogans. So then there is this, uh, you know, this kind of reverse question of, do people have to sort of uh, you know, make their political claims as abstract kind of neutral human beings, which is actually a norm that conforms to maybe some other kind of identity, as opposed to their own lived identity as Muslims, in order to be heard, and you know, and and that's something that that people in that that region have you know have had to uh, deal with. So there's that. There's also the way in which it is. So there is an aspect of them being Muslims which plays a role here. It is also in under what conditions. The question is also under what conditions is Islamophobia a useful way to understand what's going on? And those conditions globally, in terms of. India and China being able to present these projects of what they are doing as modernizing projects that are dealing with an always already suspect problematic kind of people who happen to be Muslims does tie into the global uh, you know, idea of, of is global Islamophobic themes that have become especially accentuated after the, you know, the kind of 9-11 war on terror era. So, so you know, in, in, if we think about this in terms of the contemporary virus language, sorry, my paper's just falling out of my lap. If we think about it in terms of the contemporary virus language, then, you know, then Islamophobia is a kind of, it's a, it's a receptor for, it's an ideological receptor for things to, you know, for certain things, uh, for things that can be, that can bind to it and make sense for, for people. So there's, there's that element. There is, of course, an undeniably important role of Islamophobia as a kind of strategy used by the post 20, especially by the post 2014 uh, Modi led BJP government. And this is something that, uh, you know, I've written separately in, in one of the recent pieces in society in space about Islamophobia in India, that there's, you know, Indian Muslims are seen as suspect citizens. Kashmiri Muslims are seen as potential terrorists or latent terrorists. Rohingya Muslims and other Muslim immigrants are seen as invasive pests. And Pakistan as this kind of neighboring state is seen as an existential other. So there's this kind of multifaceted Islamophobia that is very important. I mean, there have 
in numerous instances, too, too, too many to get into here, but very egregious instances of explicit Islamophobic violence that is carried out uh, against people. So there is a role for looking at Islamophobia in this case, but not a straightforward role, because if they, this was a straightforward Muslim project, then Muslim countries you know, countries with Muslim majority populations in West Asia or the Middle East would not be honoring Modi at the same time as what was being done in Kashmir in August 2019. Then many more countries would be speaking up against China in, uh, you know, and its actions in Xinjiang and, and many more Muslim countries and Muslim leaders would be speaking up ab about it, but they don't. So it's also partly this kind of, you know, there are also these other um, business and corporate and other linkages which play a really significant role. So. The, the, the thing about Muslims is, you know, about Islam or, or communalization is not a straightforward one. One final thing to add is, is in relation to communalization as a phrase, it's used in the South Asian context to mean something like sectarianism. So when we say Kashmir is communalized, it means that, and Kashmiri pundits, which is Kashmir's Hindu minority, are, are seen as the only rightful Kashmiris. Uh, by, by the Indian state, and and you know, there's, and and that becomes weaponized. So that's that's what I refer to in relation to communalization. And I would completely agree with your, um, you know, the the person you quote your your speaker in another week about, you know, about the critiques of Huntington being so important. Um, uh, Edward Said's piece on on Huntington's um, clash of civilizations is like the the short, a, a very short, compressed, useful critique. Um, the, uh, there's a South Asian writer, uh, very well known, Manto, M-A-N-T-O. He had a, a short story written at the time of the partition in which there's a score man and he looks at, you know, something that, and he just basically does a statement in the story where he says, well, you know, regimes come and go, but for us, things don't change very much. So, so your point, you know, your first point about the ways in which the nature of power and those structures actually are inhabited by different actors um, but they're not fundamentally altered simply because uh, there's a there's a kind of different name. I want to uh, bring in a, a question that somebody posed, which is like, I think a natural follow up because I think you've suggested that Islamophobia provides a partial framework. But of course, what we've seen with the Modi response to the farmers protest suggests that it's not the only framework. Right. And I'm sure many of you listening have been watching as the Indian government tears up roads, cuts communications, and is really trying to violently suppress um, a farmer's protest in India. So I wonder how that complicates the analysis. And there's a question here posed that, and I'll read it out loud. You know, Do you think there are similarities between the states, India's legitimization of its action in Kashmir and what is happening in the Punjab today? Um, and why do you think people are more inclined to support the Kisan movement, the peasant movement, when they have been with um, then then they have been with Kashmir, who's been on which has been on lockdown for one and a half years. Does religion pay a play a part? Hmm. Yeah. So uh, quickly in relation to the three questions, the first one. So the the uh, yes, absolutely. The the farmers protest, the anti uh, CAA NRC protest, all of these protests. They've they've shown quite clear, and not 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 even just these. I mean, if we go back a few years, um, twenty sixteen when uh, the JNU the JNU protests, uh, JNU is a university in in um, critical university in. Uh, uh, Progressive Critical University in New Delhi, Jawaharlal Nehru University. There in 2016, uh, students were accused of, student leaders were accused of anti-nationalism, of sedition, imprisoned. Uh, and so, so there was, you know, and at the point at which they were to appear in court, the lawyers marched in support of the government chanting Hindu religious slogans. So this is part of a long-standing project that since 2014 has been engineered. And especially with that, with that combination of global leaders, uh, you know, especially before uh, uh, in the kind of Trump era until the end of the Trump era, that combination of global leaders who were in, in multiple countries in, enacting similar sorts of regimes that they, uh, you know, who were, I, I define them as, as electorally legitimated misogynist authoritarians uh, who, who uh, you know, who claim a monopoly on nationalism, come to power challenging neoliberalism, but end up profiting from crony capitalism. And so that, you know, that's kind of like this global league. And, and in that sense, the Modi-Trump connection played a very important role in legitimizing that within India as saying that he must be doing this right because look, the president of America 
is is so on board with him that you know they share the stage they say these same things and uh, and it it really mattered to his followers because those are the visuals that they would see on tv that you know this is this guy is making sense because the whole world respects him for what he's doing so in in that sense this this is part of a longer project of co-constructing ideas of economy and nation so you know when they talk about when modi talked about surgical strike uh, in the context of kashmir in 2016 in november 2016 uh this kind of surgical strike against pakistan then he used that same metaphor uh, i've argued in my work on on of the surgical strike in relation to demonetization uh which was a you know 80 something percent of the country's currency was rendered ineffective overnight and it brought enormous amounts of hardship to large numbers of people many of whom died but he said well this is a surgical strike so actually the the kashmir the the um kind of slippage from the kashmir rhetoric is very useful and kashmir is a, is the most useful thing as a rallying point for the for the hindu nation um the the second point about about gender yes the the kind of uh, in the punjab context i wanted to say yes yeah, so there is an overall kind of proper it's a specific type of of claim of of power that is exercised which is proprietorial it's gendered it's emotive you know in in relation to kashmir and and you know it's about the sov- the idea of sovereignty of india and that that being non negotiable and um and so the spectrum from human rights abuses uh, well documented human rights abuses both in both in both of those cases all the way to in the case of kashmir the right to self determination now kashmir is the hardest thing for anyone to speak up about in india because dissent on other things i mean the the kind of the net is being narrowed but dissent on other things would would you know would to certain extents historically have been accepted but on kashmir it becomes sedition it becomes sort of like immediately anti national so therefore you know there's this kind of a kind of an extra mile of difficulty in talking about uh, uh, kashmir as opposed to uh, other protests the farmers protests are also interesting because the ways in which this government is trying to kind of you know they've used for uh, as, you know uh, talked about this as as folk tongue speech they talk about different constituencies of people and construct dualities that they keep in motion so you know say something to the farmers and say something to the 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 corporates and both of those things are clearly contradictory and but they're intentionally contradictory they're meant to keep in play a, a certain kind of politics that is constructed out of this kind of contradictory speech what is happening now with the farmers protest is that they have to eventually at some point you know get to grips with their uh, you know with with these transformations which are you know so the hindutva and development which they kept in play at the same time as we're going to bring development we're going to you know give you pride of being hindu citizens of a hindu india now with the farmers protest they're having to actually make some move some clear move that you know that is not just about identity but it actually is going to materially harm the you know many of the many people in india um and and that's why i think that this is this is the one that has faced the the most amount of of pushback um the um what they you know what they what they have learned from these colonial laboratories as in history they're you know now use of um internet shutdowns once that you know what those sorts of things shutting down the newspapers internet things that they would do in the peripheries now is ever more happening in you know in kind of mainland in 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 the the kind of heart of the country so um your yeah so the so the thing about kashmir i think is is simply that it it's seen very easily as seditious it's seen as something that um so therefore people it's either silenced or kind of censored or or people who speak about it are are punished and and that's that's a longer history not just a bjp history yeah so here i think it might be useful to ask um a question um and i said come come back to who's i see here so i don't know if you want to ask it yourself said first but just to kind of set set up the connection i see that you're talking about a government that for the most part uses its kind of nationalism as as a defense against criticism of its laws and especially like in kashmir but and this is obviously very similar to what happens in china um and not not just with kashmir now but also with the farmers protests Um so Said has a question about you know is this similar to what we have seen in the United States where a lot of um pol- a lot of politicians right some in particular have been very successful by leveraging dissatisfaction with globalization um and if, does that explain sort of the appeal of right wing politics or nationalist politics let's say in India but I don't know Said if you want to kind of explain yeah, your question a bit further 
May I jump in? Because this also has a name in the West, like in America at least, it's called elite failure. So like basically they explain the failure, elite failure, you know, with the rise of ethnic nationalism, racism and nativism. So, and then we know also India, you know, it, it has been ruled by the elites in the post-colonial era for a long time. And these elites also had, you know, colonial legacy. So I was asking, you know, to her, you know, that like, what are the parallels between the two? And also, if, if you see any parallels between these two examples, like um, what role the colonial legacy might have played in this? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, this is uh, this is something that I'm, I'm glad you asked me this because it, it gives me a chance to uh, elaborate on something that I would have liked to speak a bit more about. So there's a, a kind of more detailed version of what I'm going to say is uh, available in an article uh, called The Pol Political Project of Postcolonial Neoliberal Nationalism where I argue that we need to think of, and, and this is specifically, uh, this is what I, I'm challenging there, is this opposition of neoliberalism and nationalism. This idea that these are two opposed forces, be that in the US or India or elsewhere, this idea that there is, you know, there is identity and there is economy and this kind of the appeal to identity sort of nationalist sort of forces is something that happens in reaction to, to neoliberalism. I mean, that's problematic in multiple ways, too long to go into here, but also I would challenge the very idea of the elite. I mean, there is there is no way in which the, the you know, the current ruling uh, people are not elite. They are, uh, you know, in terms of um, any any kind of capital, you name it. So it's, it's however, it is useful as a, as a strategy. But again, it's not just that, uh, you know, so, so it isn't neoliberalism and nationalism as opposing forces, but it's also, the, again, the role played by post-colonial in that. So the so I argue that this idea of economy and the nation are co-constructed, and that it gives us this kind of and and by not looking at that, it gives us this um, it makes it possible to see systematically how local versus international, material versus symbolic, regressive versus progressive are kind of mapped into a neat binary. So that you know what does it mean to be Western is is a specific thing. What does it mean to be developed is a specific thing, and um, so so that's sort of like the um, you know I would say that that nation and economy in their rhetoric aren't two separate things, but they the, the politics is made out of uh, those two together. The example, the detailed kind of case I look at in that context, um, and, and you know, the US context might have, par I, I actually do say, highlight some of the parallels with the, with the US case there, but the Make in India initiative. So the government launched this Make in India project as a, as a thing that, you know, that would be about making in India. This is, it, it, there's a long story that goes from BJP in the 90s being an economically nationalist party that was all about Swadeshi, which is like, we make our own things. It's economic nationalism that they were supporting. So they went from, from Swadeshi to, uh, you know, so the journey from Swadeshi to make in India was made by various kinds of very problematic reconciliations where they started to say things like, well, Swadeshi and globalization are actually the same thing. Uh, so if you if you saw their rhetoric, it would make no sense because effectively they're saying, well, actually import substitution and free market are the same thing, which which they aren't. But uh, so the the ways in which this project shifted over time and how they've even now officially it's a make in India project. So the idea is that they're going to, you know, this is about encouraging. And yet at the same time, they are there. There's reports I cite where the government actually says to its ministries that actually you, you give us the orders for doing those things because it's not actually the Make in India thing that is happening, not to mention the fact that the entire Make in India logo and project is something that is made outside of India. So this, this the ways in which nationalism is, uh, you know, is, is part of this governmentality, this post-colonial neoliberal nationalist governmentality is, is complex and, and, and it isn't as if there is a nation and there is an economy you know, there is a nation related stuff and economy related stuff and they're separate and then they come together. These, these two are constructed, rhetorics on these two are constructed in and through each other. Um, and I, I, just, I mean, I, I, it's too early to say anything about, about now in the US, but certainly numerous parallels with, with Trump era US and, um, and what's going on in, uh, in India. Uh, the, the, the two main differences I would say is that um, the, the media in the U.S. had had a has a much you know has a kind of much more of a voice and did much more was able to do much more and did much more than than in India right now, where uh, both the media and the judiciary and I'm kind of going slightly off topic, but I think that it's interesting in relation also in the comparison to the Chinese case because what is happening is not a it, it's not a kind of contravention of law 
it's not so much a contravention of law, but an, a subversion of the law in the name of the law is what they're doing. So the the you know the are the, the things in the you know the 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 laws, the statements, everything that they state, it's all there. They've just meant made them mean something very different. And and judicial quietude and the judgments and the judges and the role of the judges has been so important in in what's going on in in the in the Indian case. And very much uh, you know, and the, the role of China in India is so significant that that China is seen as this kind of other, which is authoritarian and communist, whereas India is democratic. And yet at the same time, China is seen as, as a, you know, as an ideal to kind of look up to. Uh, so the, the because, Mo, because Xi Jinping is seen as a strong leader who's made China, you know, who's kind of, you know, China's on the world stage, he is a great leader. And Modi is that kind of a leader. So at the same time, so, so the idea is that he's the kind of leader who can cut through the noise of a democracy and deliver and make us be like China because China is powerful and strong and everyone respects China. And therefore Modi in India has that kind of function that, you know, that, that Xi Jinping. So, so China plays a really curious role. And this idea, I think often in the US and, and elsewhere that one hears about India and China as being very different sorts of, of powers. And that somehow India is actually substantively democratic, especially with this regime, that it's actually somehow going to do anything differently than China is, is um, you know, it's, it's uh, I have seen some arguments and I would say pay much more attention to those kinds of arguments that are highlighting how these two uh, strategies, you know, the Indian and Chinese strategies at the moment have far more in common than different. Oh. Forget about whether one is called democratic and one is called communist in, in actual terms in terms of you know how they're exercising power in their peripheries the sorts of economic linkages the kinds of you know the the role of tech, digital authoritarianism technological firms being involved in these ventures there is so much more that that kind of unites them i mean um not unites that's not a good word that kind yeah. of that is in common there as opposed to what is different um and and you know and i think that um in, in the Kashmir case, it's so easy to see how many of these things are actually being learned from China. Yeah, I mean, on that question, I don't know if I have time to fully answer this, but uh, someone uh, in the chat, Arnab Ghosh, who actually writes about China and India together has a follow-up question on that particular. Um, so maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe this could be like a parting comment, Arnab, and maybe we don't have time to necessarily get an answer from Natasha, but Arnab, if you wanna kind of vocalize, um, cause I think your question is actually on the same point as what Natasha was just saying. Uh, hi, Natasha. Yeah, so it's actually related. Um, but first of all, thank you for that excellent article uh, and, and for your comments today. Um, so this is partly sort of a, an invitation to, to, to speculate on uh, certain longer term trends in a different area in sort of education, broadly speaking, because one of the things where so also actually one other footnote, I fully agree with you that in never have India and China been more alike, you know, in the past 70 years than they are today. But one other area in which they are actually alike is this longer term trend that we see in education, in particular, the privileging of STEM disciplines and uh, the accompanying actual disdain of any kind of humanistic uh, inquiry, right? Uh, and now if you look at the people who have benefited the most and the people who are the strongest votaries of ethno-nationalism in both PRC and the Republic of India today are precisely the middle class that is predominantly, you know, has an origin, you know, have, have STEM training, have benefited the most uh, since economic liberal liberalization and, and sort of uh, particularly valorized technocratic solutions, efficient solutions and so on. So how much of uh, what we're seeing now also can be traced to these longer term choices that have been made with regard to education, education policy, how much of that is also a factor and, and, and sort of an issue that needs to be addressed for any kind of sort of more progressive uh, future? Thank mm. you. Yeah, so sorry, we should jump in and say, you know, maybe we could say for a little bit afterwards, but we should also formally conclude because of the time limit. Um, on the event. Um, I don't, Elizabeth, you want to say a few words to kind of wrap things up? Say we do. I mean, obviously, Natasha, you are raising so many issues. I think we'd love to stay here for hours. I do want to invite those who have other engagements and who would only schedule 60 minutes that we will not be offended if you bow out now. We invite you to come back. Um, we're starting programming in March on decolonizing art, where we're going to feature um, sort of museum studies professionals, curators, and artists and continue the conversation. I will invite those who want to stay with Natasha's consent that we can just kind of carry on informally. Um, if you want to stay, stay for the conversation, great. If you have to go, that's also completely um, understood. So Natasha, it's really when you 
when you feel like it's time to end, you let us know because I think that we're all very, very intrigued and engaged with with you. With, with your Thank you. I do want to respond to this point because I think it's really important. The you know the the thing with um with edu with education and kind of there's there's just so much happening in in terms of the transformation politically, socially, economically in in these in these major parts of the world that a lot of it is often kind of you know under under the radar as as it were people don't even notice that it's happening and education sector is is an important one in that sense and the you know the ultimate aim is of course within the, these countries is to reshape the social forces and the 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 thing about critical humanistic sort of inquiry is that it it worries these leaders because you know as as with all kinds of uh, all all of these kinds of leaders no matter what they call them if they want a certain kind of power they don't want people to ask them questions uh, sometimes quite explicitly, such as not even taking a press conference. I mean, the Indian Prime Minister took not a single press conference in his first five years in, in power. So there's there's no, but there's also this kind of critical inquiry per se is seen as as very problematic in in um, in the just in the last uh, maybe two weeks. Um, there's uh, they, they brought out this notification in India that uh, the the ministry um, uh, one of the ministries is that, that there's a there's a so Indian universities central universities cannot invite academics from overseas to take part in seminars. I mean, this has made some news somewhere, but I think way more people should be aware of this, that you know, in, in a democratic context, it's, it's outrageous now that all of our discussions happen online. Uh, you know, the, the, these rules in effect make it, make it impossible for Indian universities to have interaction with academics who are based outside of India. On, on any subject. They have to be approved by the Ministry of External Affairs or something. And, uh, and this is an, I mean, it's part of, again, a longer longer term process whereby uh, university employees of central uh, universities were, uh, you know, there were circulars that they cannot host discussions uh, on critical topics. In so some states, including Gujarat, there's PhD students have to get their topics approved by the government. So there's been this kind of, this, this um, very strong, um, uh, you know, kind of move to, Stamp down on dissent in 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 every sphere, and and education is a really important one, which is why the critical universities are under attack. Most of them have had their leadership, you know, kind of their the central figures in those universities have been replaced by pliant kind of government supporting sorts of persons. Um, JNU is no exception. Likewise with museums and other important heritage bodies. So there's this kind of um, I mean I, I wrote a, about something about this in 2015, and already there was all of that happening back then, and you know it's just become so much more accelerated now. Um, so yes, that is a, a problem. Another thing that came to mind in relation to that is the role of diaspora. And I think that's that's going to become ever more important. As we do now see, I mean, I don't know, uh, I'm sure it's, you, you have some version of this in the US, but we see the role of the, you know, the Chinese students and the Chinese diaspora organizations uh, in, in critical, you know, in universities here that, you know, that to host certain kinds of topics that, you know, it's kind of either offensive to sentiments or something or students protest and they say, well, you know, you're insulting my country, et, et cetera. So the, the role of, of diasporic people and organizations is really important and is going to become ever more important in legitimizing these, um, you know, these uh, regimes because the, the, the kind of the Indian diaspora here and a prominent figure, I mean, you had your um, Nikki Haley or, or America had Nikki Haley. Uh, here we have Preeti Patel, uh, you know, a similar sort of figure, uh, very paradoxical figures who at the same, who in, at, in, you know, who will simultaneously talked about how they cannot, they cannot, she could not do anything wrong because she grew up as the, as the daughter of immigrants, yet at the same time, bring about policies that say, well, we'll shut down our borders and keep outsiders out and all of that and be like su super right wing. So, and, and these figures, these uh, important figures in the diaspora, as well as um, the general idea of diasporic individuals who are, you know, who, who historically, of course, in the 90s and so on, were, were important funding channels also for, for right-wing parties, but who in the West are, are very concerned with minority rights, and we'll, we'll talk about that, but actually are okay, quite okay with being supremacists, uh, you know, kind of religious supremacists or, or uh, Hindu supremacists specifically uh, back home, so, uh, or in countries of origin. So there's, uh, so I think that this is something that, uh, that, that we will see more of, including in, in politics and, 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 and it's accompanied by this equivalent thing of any kind of critical voices in the diaspora 
being so so a certain kind of diasporic individual is welcome to speak as long as they're supporting the regime but critical voices in the diaspora are foreigners who are trying to meddle with you know with our internal affairs what do they know or what right do they have to talk about our country and and this is i mean it's it's not it's sad and this kind of project of creating consent is, is understandable but it's not of course uniquely indian or chinese or whatever that is i mean I, I do want to reiterate that this is not something that is that anyone has an kind of any kind of a priori propensity to be this kind of you know to to be these kinds of people or to exercise power in these kinds yeah. of ways history is is um uh, shows us otherwise um and, and in that sense, whether it's US, this is why going back to this idea of the West and the space and role of this category West and what it means in terms of rights is, is just so proud. I think if we kind of whittle that away and if we don't let it be used in this way to define, uh, you know, kind of legacies of human rights or histories, then I think we have a better chance of being able to address the interconnected um, injustices, oppressions and uh, dispossessions that are happening simultaneously at, at kind of you know, in, uh, in, in different parts of the world. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm shocked or uh, very flattered everyone's, a lot of people have begun to stick around still. Um, I wanted to bring in another scholar who, um, Natasha, Natasha knows, um, Darren Byler, who has, I think, done some of the most interesting work on what's going on in Xinjiang today, and he happens to be in the audience. So Darren, I don't know, do you want to kind of um, throw up a few questions uh, for Natasha? Yeah, sure. It's great to see you, Natasha. Um, great to hear you speak on this on these issues. Um, I have two questions. They're kind of related. One is about language and epistemic difference. You know, Uyghurs are seen as different because they speak a different language. I mean, that's part of the story, um, and because uh, and because of that, their their knowledge systems, the sort of literature they produce. Uh, the, the knowledge they carry with them is seen as less valuable than Chinese knowledge. I mean, that's that's sort of the, the general discourse that Uyghurs are seen as backward because they don't speak Chinese. Um, so I'm wondering if there's some parallels in the way that Kashmiris are viewed by other Muslims, by sort of the, the broader public in India as being backward because they have you know some epistemic difference or lang language difference. Um, and a part of that is, you know, because they are seen as lacking, they need to be developed. and one of the ways that I talk with the Han people tell me they think about the Xinjiang situation is that, you know, everyone needs to be developed. Uyghurs are backward. And so they know it's going to be difficult for Uyghurs, but in the end, it'll be good for them because then they'll be developed. Um, so I'm wondering about how development discourse figures in the, into this discussion. And you've already touched on it to some extent, but I'm wondering if you could be a little bit more explicit about the relationship between capitalism and colonialism, if development discourse and capitalism is, is something that's producing a, a sort of new frontier and that colonialism could be thought of as co-constructing capitalism. Um, that's something that you know, scholars of racial capitalism that are working in the US context are talking about in relation to settler colonialism here. Um, so those are just some thoughts um, and feel free to take them wherever you want. Thank you. And I would like to, yeah, it's, it's really good to see you. So Darren and I were uh, met at this conference here and was it last, it was last year? Yeah, it was last year. I mean, because of Corona, everything feels like a million years ago. It was last year, last spring, actually the last, the last public event that I was able to actually physically attend. So yeah, um, the, the thing about um, language, language, um, so, so, okay, so there's, there's a, so there's a, in that sense, I think Kashmir actually has parallels with the Balkans, because if you think about the, the complex patchwork of, of regions and, and kind of identities that are part of the broader erstwhile historical kind of uh, uh, princely state. Uh, before, you know, before 1947, uh, then there are, so there's not just one language, there are multiple languages in that, because all of these places were bracketed into that princely state. So there's, you know, what are now, uh, what is now Azad Kashmir, what is now Gilgit Baltistan, what is now Ladakh, uh, what was Jammu and Kashmir, you know, what was Jammu and Kashmir, but is now Jammu and Kashmir as one union territory and Ladakh as the other. So there's kind of, if in the broader sense, there are there is a patchwork quilt of these different regions with different kinds of identities. And, and that reflects, I think, some of the complexities of kind of these Himalayan roots of you know of, of trade and of interaction and you can see that in terms of identity and um in in the regions but the the language that is seen as you know the kind of the native language of the valley kashir which is the kashmiri language 
is not something that is spoken. So in Jammu, it's, it's Dogri. In Ladakh, it's a different one. In, in Balti, Sheena, in, in, in other regions. But the, the main kind of since Kashmir Valley is that becomes the focal point of this, um, you know, of this um, political dispute, then the language there is Kashmir. And that is something that, yes, I mean, I think up until maybe the late 90s, uh, I mean, if, for the longest time, it was not allowed to be taught at university. So it wasn't, you know, there wasn't even a department of that language in the in the university. There, um, and so people have, and uh, this is something that I noticed more and more in uh, in between 2015. So I, uh, you know, between 2010 and 2015, there was a long gap that I wasn't there, and then very frequently from 2015 to 2019, and I noticed these kinds of changes. So in Kashmir, people do not understand the Hindi script. The Hindi is Hindi is one, you know, India's major national language. So they don't understand the, the Hindi script. Yet more and more you see billboards in Kashmir that are lettered in Hindi. So which, which people there cannot understand. So, you know, sometimes somebody would, would kind of show me and say, well, can you please read that for me? Because, you know, I, I would know Kashmiri and Hindi both. So there's a, there's a, 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 a conscious attempt to change the, the landscape, the symbolic landscape, and to not actually have literatures in the local languages. And that doing that, keeping that alive is something that is, has always been about swimming against kind of the tide the 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 in terms of the subjects and what is taught uh, likewise with dress actually the the feren is really important so the the feren is a is a kashmiri traditional kashmiri garment it's a loose outer garment worn in the winters it's very warm and loose and that is again something so at, at one point there were hotels that would not you know that would not allow kashmiris wearing their own native dress to enter into uh, those and the idea was that you know they could conceal weapons inside that or something so you know there's this kind of various kinds of delegitimizations of dress and um, and and um, and um, language but also food so an indian right wing bollywood actor who went there to shoot recently uh, they had so traditional kashmiri cuisine is called vazwan and it's made of different kinds of meat dishes i mean that's what it's always historically been and in fact even the hindu minority of kashmir um, to which I belong by birth, would, uh, you know, would also eat meat, which is, which is unusual. So, uh, so it's, it's a region where meat eating is, is, is common. Um, and, but this person went there and he said, well, you know, this is all wrong. They can't, we have to create a vegetarian vazwan that, you know, this is now a part of India. This place is now a part of India. And what they need is a vegetarian version of their traditional cuisine. And that's what we want to have. And I've often been struck by, you know, going uh, over time is how many more and more pure vegetarian eateries keep turning up in a place where the local food is, is completely non-vegetarian. So there's, so in terms of diet and uh, dress and, um, and language, there's this kind of multifaceted attempt to create an understanding of that identity as being backward and, and regressive and, you know, and, and this kind of the new, the new developed modern Kashmiri identity of Kashmiris who are now properly a part of India will be something that will overcome the, the, those kinds of, you know, problems or flaws or, or backwardnesses. Um, the, the notion of development, yes, I mean, I've, I've written about this, including more recently uh, in, in on Kashmir, this idea that, I, you know, it's, it's striking that this longer history of development as um, playing the role, same kind of role as, you know, Escobar and others have pointed out of a civilizing mission in a different age. So this idea that development is something that is done to people and not by them that it's, you know, you go and you develop them. <laughs> um, and in the case of Kashmir, develop them whether they like it or not. We're not going to ask you. I mean, the whole point of that longest ever shutdown was that we don't want to know what you think and we don't want your consent or your ability to dissent. We're going to develop you, we're going to modernize you and you will at some point be grateful for what we have done. But, you know, right now we just have to do this because we need to get you from point A to point B. And in that sense, the, uh, the, so some of the interesting things that happened is that when, when the revocation of autonomy and the loss of statehood uh, was announced, these were two things. So what, so this Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh were part of one state, which was called, you know, Indian state, which was called Jammu and Kashmir. What they did was they divided that into two, Jammu and Kashmir being one, Ladakh, which was not part of the official name being the other. And then they made both of those not states anymore, but as union territories, which means their police forces are controlled from the center. They don't have lots and lots of kinds of powers that they had before, uh, including now recent changes that their bureaucracy can also be from anywhere else in India so that you don't actually have any administrative links with, with people. 
And the idea of the state, Indian state is now that the only unresolved issue is the Pakistan side of Kashmir and we're going to, get, going to get that too at some point. I mean, this is not a problem. So in this context, when they did that on the August the 5th and they you know, kind of shut down all communications and the curfews were imposed and people started to be imprisoned and placed under house arrests, they had um, the um, four days, five days later on 12th August, I think, or even 9th, uh, the most one of the most important industrialists in India and a backer of the Modi regime, Ambani, he announced the setting up of a development task force for Kashmir. And, you know, so his his company Reliance, I mean, uh, you might have already heard of this company. It's like a big major company, of course, uh, you know, they tied up with Saudi Aramco. Uh, so there was news of that. And then they announced that they were going to set up this development task force and they were going to go in and develop Kashmir. Uh, and they arranged various summits and then they were canceled at some point. And I'm sure after that, you know, things happened once they once they brought in these changes of being able to acquire land, etc. So the resources in terms of forestry and, you know, and other kinds of resources are, of course, an important um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's economically and in terms of natural resources, a very rich area. And that is something that, um, that that's, a, that's a part of, you know, that's, that's part of the, the kind of the, the capitalist or accumulative uh, appropriating thing that, that they're going in for is to, to actually have Indian companies, you know, access those resources, land, forests, and, and so on. Um, yeah. So, so yes, and, and, and that history of, of colonialism and capitalism and then the racial capitalism, all of that, I think is, is totally on, on, yeah, um, on point with, with understanding how these changes are, are not just, you know, they're not happening without, without uh, the, the economic motives. Indeed, many of this is legitimized because of the companies that, that stand to gain from, from making those things, whether that's pellets or, you know, barbed wires or, um, or, or other things. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so we could talk obviously for hours more, but I've, we've already taken 33% extra labor from you than we agreed to. So um, thanks so much, Natasha. Thanks to everyone for sticking around. It's uh, truly, honestly, like very, very, very touching that everyone actually wanted to stick around and kind of break your schedules to, to, to keep hearing the conversation. Thanks to everyone for listening and thanks for those who asked questions. Um, I don't know, Elizabeth, you want to kind of add any sort of uh, finishing thoughts in terms of the LePage Center? No, again, just we hope you'll stay with us, right? We, we go every Wednesday, we start a new theme in the month of March. So the new theme is decolonizing art. Um, we have some incredible um, speakers, starting with Dr. Monique Scott, who's the director of museum studies at Bryn Mawr. And then we move on um, March 10th, we're featuring Dan Hicks, who recently wrote an incredible book called The Brutish Museum about the Benin Bronzes. Um, and, the, and the history of the British Museum. So we hope you will stay with us. I wanna echo Andy's thank you for all of you for joining us and particular thank you to Natasha. And speaking of food, we wanna let Natasha go and enjoy a nice dinner. And on that note, we, will, we hope to see you soon. This video will be posted within a week or so. So um, we, would, you know, we would love if you, if you circulate it to, to friends and colleagues and you know, again, join us next month. Thank you so much. Thank you.